Uh, thank you uh, for inviting us this evening for a journey around San Francisco Bay, visiting places yeah. that we're all familiar with and take for granted, which contain hidden relics from the Bay's shipping nautical past. A fleet of ghost ships appropriate for Halloween that came to San Francisco Bay or the Gulf of the Farallones and never left. I hope by the time the journey ends, you'll be more aware of what you're sailing over or past, walking over, driving over, or in one case, riding through as you get your, as you move around San Francisco and its waters. Water? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Spanish Manila, Manila galleons began sailing past San Francisco Bay hundreds of years ago, but they never stopped in because they missed the point. Uh, Sir Francis Drake, 1588, Kareem his uh, Golden Pine at Drake's Bay. I'm a Drake's Bay fan. I think that's, that's where it happened. Uh, and then finally, on August 5 of 1775, Captain Juan de Ayala, Ayala sailed the Spanish packet ship San Carlos through what we now call the Golden Gate, becoming the first European that we know of to sail into San Francisco Bay. Since that time, San Francisco has become one of the world's great ports. Uh, and in that time, hundreds of ships have completed their final voyage on the rocks, on the beaches, <laughs> beneath the water, and under the ground. Some estimate as many as 4,000. They remain ghost ships for the most part, where they ended their lives and remain. This evening we're going to visit some of those ghost ships and look and see where they are. First we'll spend some time, uh, i got to click here. Well, uh, first we're going to uh, visit uh, ships uh, called steam schooners. Steam, steam schooners here in Sausalito and at Point San Pablo. Then we're going to go back to the gold rush and visit some gold rush ships that never left. And finally, uh, Navy ships, and part of that at the end will be my friend Garland Sloan, uh, U.S. Navy Seaman First Class Cor Hospital, Cor Hospital Corpsman Garland Sloan, who was aboard <coughs> Uh, USS Benevolence when uh, she was in a collision with the uh, Mary. Looking back, uh, and uh, in case you've ever sailed the Half Moon Bay, uh, you've sailed right over Benevolence. <laughs> so here we go. Sausalito and San Pablo. Let's start uh, with a description of the steam schooner. Uh, in the latter part, the latter part of the 19th century and into the 20th century, uh, when ships began to acquire engines that got them around rather than sails, uh, a particular kind of ship was developed in Northern California here called the steam schooner. Uh, some of you may remember Wapama, which sat on the barge down by the Army Corps of Engineers until it was uh, taken away. They were about 240 of them constructed over the years, sometime between around 1880 and 1920. Uh, they hauled lumber down from as far as Puget Sound, uh, primarily though many of them from the coasts of Sonoma and Mendocino counties. Uh, they also delivered back to those small communities uh, the goods that were needed to keep life going, where these towns had little or no access overland to get there. Uh, most of the steam scooters also had cabins for transporting passengers uh, back and forth between these small towns in San Francisco. They were the semi-trucks, the Greyhound buses, and the Amazon drivers <laughs> of the day. Uh, so let's, they, they, and they reigned for about 50 years until finally the railroads and then the highways punched their way through 
to these small uh, places. Uh, and you have to remember that it was only in about 1940 that finally there was a paved road between San Francisco and Oregon. Uh, it isn't that long ago. So let's take a closer look at two of these uh, ships. Seafoam uh, was built, hang on just a second. Seafoam, SS Seafoam, was built in Aberdeen, Washington, and most of these ships were, in fact, built in the Northwest, either in Washington or Oregon, because that's where the supply of lumber was for building them. Uh, most of them were then filled with lumber as uh, hulls, towed to San Francisco, where uh, various iron works in San Francisco and Alameda and Oakland installed the machinery and they were finished off with uh, houses and all of the other apparatus that they could carry. Seafoam was built in 1905. Uh, she had a 500 horsepower compound steam engine. Uh, she was 339 tons, could carry about 250,000 board feet of lumber. Uh, that would build 20 to 30 typical houses of the era. Uh, and she was rather small. She was designed to stop at the dog hole ports along the Sonoma Mendocino uh, coast where there were no facilities. Uh, here's a photo of sea foam um, loading uh, lumber. And you can see that uh, they stack lumber once they filled the hole, they stack lumber on the deck as high as the captain thought it was safe to uh, do that. Uh, and uh, then uh, dimensions for sea foam. She was 127 feet by 32 by 10 feet deep in the hole. Uh, from 1911 until 1931, uh, sea foam made about an average of two round trips between San Francisco and um, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, places like Point Arena uh, and Mendocino and other places up and down the coast. So, uh, coming down, she looked like this. Going back, she carried machinery for the mills. She carried the goods that went into the grocery stores and the other mercantile places that sold clothing and shoes and other things for the people who live there. Uh, and she also carried, there's a, picture, a painting of uh, seafoam loaded down. Uh, she carried uh, goods for individuals. You could s send a shopping list down uh, and it would be taken to a merchant in San Francisco who would fill your order. So if you wanted some cigars, if you wanted some wine, if you wanted a bolt of cloth to sew some clothing, if you wanted a pair of shoes, if you wanted, but you didn't want to buy them at the local store or didn't have it, uh, there would be shopping done for you and it would come back on Seafoam. Uh, Seafoam also carried passengers. Uh, getting onto the ship might have been the most exciting part of the trip. <laughs> uh, and, uh, this is a later version of the boarding gate. Uh, the earlier version is simply a platform that you sit on like a swing. Uh, and hang on and go back and forth. Uh, you'll notice the ladies are seated, seated with their hats. By the way, a lot of these pictures are going to be kind of fuzzy because they're old pictures and they're, they're they're not all that clear, but you can see the hats. And the gentlemen hanging on the outside are also, of course, wearing the uniform of the day, uh, the suit and the hat. Uh, in 1931, Seafoam met the same fate as a lot of her sister ships. Uh, this is Seafoam on the ground in, at Point Arena. And the next day, this is Seafoam um, really on the beach in uh, 1931. That was the end of her career. Uh, if you want to 
look farther, there's a museum in Mendocino with seafoam artifacts. Or you can actually sleep at the Seafoam Motel at Little Rift. <laughs> oh uh, moving on, Wapama. Wapama was built uh, at Savis Island, just downriver from Portland. And Wapama represents the larger version of the uh, steam scooter. Uh, she was 217 feet overall. 42 feet wide, and the depth in the weight was 19 feet, and she uh, had a gross tonnage of 945. Uh, she primarily hauled lumber between the far northwest, Seattle, uh, Aberdeen, places like that on the Washington coast. Uh, she was not properly fitted to go into those little dog holes, so she was a, an ocean liner, if you will, on um, the lumber trade. When the lumber trade <clears throat> moved to rail and moved to rail, uh, Wapama continued to uh, serve. And, and here's a picture of her uh, between San Francisco and San Pedro, hauling passengers and uh, goods on the coast. In uh, about 1935, she was sold to uh, the north her name was changed to Tongas, and she was employed in moving people and goods from Seattle to Alaska <coughs> and bringing back frozen fish uh, from there. She ended up back down in the Bay Area and in 1958 uh, was sold to the California Division of Parks, became part of what was then the San Francisco Maritime Museum, which opened in 1963 and in 1972 when the Golden Gate National Seashore uh, came about, she was one of the museum ships at um, the uh, Hyde Street Pier. But the ship was deteriorating badly, and even though attempts were made to uh, work with her, uh, eventually uh, she was too far gone to say, but here she is on the bars that sat down by the Corps of Army Engineers. Uh, and it was determined it was going to be a multi-million dollar project which involved primarily rebuilding the whole ship. Uh, so uh, the last of the steam schooners disappeared over to Richmond in the breaking yard uh, and uh, artifacts were removed and the rest of the ship was broken up and taken to a uh, toxic landfill because it was riddled with <laughs> preservatives and things like that. Before we come to Sausalito, let's go over to San Pablo, or San Pablo. Uh, Captain Raymond Clark, who founded the Richmond San Rafael Ferry, the Charles Van Dam that used to sit up on the corner uh, of the entrance here, uh, had a side, side job or side business, which was to rent fishing boats to anglers who would go up then to Point San Pablo where there were striped bass and uh, salmon in season before the before the, the Chevron refinery was there uh, and uh, that there were fish. Uh, the problem was that there was a long row so he towed you up in for the launch and left you there and then periodically someone in the launch came by and asked if you were ready to go home uh, and so forth. Uh, it wasn't very uh, it was awkward. Uh, so uh, he bought a bunch of old schooners, which were over in Oakland, in what was then called Oakland Creek, in the Rotten Row. There were dozens of old wooden ships there uh, that were deteriorating because they were no longer useful. And he brought them, he brought seven of them around to the backside of Point San Pablo. Uh, arranged them in uh, a uh, order of two pairs and sank them. And then uh, filled in between them and built a marina. Uh, this is an aerial picture of the marina showing the uh, various old ships which are there. Uh, and this is a picture from 1946 showing uh, the, uh, the marina 
uh, to make things really work, he invented the San Pablo Yacht Club, which had its yacht club there, uh, and their, their boats were there before they moved to the Richmond and uh, You could rent a rowboat for two bucks, a bucket of bait for a quarter, and he would have you towed out and anchored somewhere in San Pablo Bay where the fish were that day, and then come and get you. Uh, Today, it's, it's, a, it's a rustic little place that very few people visit. Uh, and uh, it's primary, well, one of its primary uses when the uh, East Brother Light bed and breakfast is working is to pick you up in that launch and take you out to the uh, East Brother Light bed and breakfast for an overnight uh, on the bed. Now back to Sausalito, uh, if you will. Herb Madden Sr., a little bit later in the middle 1940s, early 1940s, during the war, uh, decided to build a marina. Uh, and uh, in order to build the marina, he remembered what had happened at San Pablo Bay. So he bought three old steam schooners and had them hauled into uh, the south end of what was to become the Sausalito Yacht Harbor. And lined up and sunk or filled with, with dirt. Uh, one of them was the uh, SS Wellesley, which had sat out in what was then Sausalito's rotten row for over a decade. And two of them were <coughs> ships that he had brought in from Oakland, the uh, Mazama and the Santa Barbara. And they're out there. Uh, we lined them up and killed them, as I said. Uh, and then, uh, a bunch of young kids decided they'd invent a yacht club. <laughs> uh, and their mothers kicked them out of their kitchens and said, you got to find a place to hold your meetings. And Herb allowed them to do so in the uh, Santa Barbara. And this is what it looks like today. Uh, these are the young guys. And this is, this is actually the Wapamas day room, but this is sort of the place that they were holding their meetings in, would have looked very much like this, except it was in a ship that had been sitting out in the open for 15 years with no care, and a year later, they, they got too vile even for the kids, and so they moved out down to the uh, now vacated San Francisco Yacht Club, uh, where the Triton Breston is now, and had had moved their uh, the Yacht Club down there. Uh, in, uh, in 1944, uh, the city government of Sausalito thought that things had turned so bad with those ships that they decided to burn them. Uh, so everybody lined up, showed up, and the mayor lit them on fire to destroy them. But someone had neglected to remember that at least one of them was buried in the mud out here with its fuel tanks filled. So there was an eruption of fire. Uh, it burned all night into the next day. And because Marin ship was turning out war uh, ships for the war effort, authorities in Oakland and Alameda and San Francisco and Hayward and even points beyond uh, sounded alarm because there were fear there was fear that uh, enemy saboteurs had come and had uh, blow, her blowing up uh, Marin ship. Uh, so uh, they're there. And if you drive out to the Spinnaker or you walk along with the Spinnaker, you're actually walking on uh, three of the last steam spinners uh, around. Uh, and of course, how many, how many people knew that? How many people knew that there were 600 feet of of steam schooners forming the spit that, that goes out to to uh, to the spinnaker. Okay, let's move on quickly. Uh, gold rush. Uh, we all know about the gold rush, uh, and uh, people were desperate to get to the gold country. Uh, they came by ship. They flew by uh, aer aeroplane of the day. Uh, 
Uh, they parachuted. They, they came on rockets uh, any way they could to get to uh, San Francisco. That's a uh, cartoon from the, uh, from the era. Mm -hmm. And they came by ship. In 1848, the non-native population in California was about 800 people. The 800 people would be Europeans. In 1849, it was estimated it was 100,000. <laughs> San Francisco's total population in 1847 was 200. In 1849, it was 35,000. The gold rush was on, and they came by ship. Uh, many of the ships they came on were old ships on the East Coast. It was profitable to buy an old ship, outfit it with uh, bunks and a galley, and uh, sell uh, uh, fair to somebody who wanted to come here uh, and by the time five or six or seven or ten months later when you got here uh, the ship <coughs> was left because not only did the gold seekers go to them to our hills but the crews uh, decided it was more profitable to dig gold than it was to hoist sails and they left as well so san francisco bay your what is what, what what was then called Yerba Buena Cove, it's now called the Financial District, was filled with hulks. Uh, this is actually John James Audubon, uh, the bird god, who came out and he drew a picture of, of those ships. The ships were lined up uh, like that, and many of them were turned into store ships. Some of them were hotels. Uh, some of them were just empty, and in 1840 and 1851, San Francisco burned the Great Fire, and it burned out into the ships. Sometimes there were individual fires on ships that, that burned them to the waterline. The result was that there were hulks littering Yerba Buena Cove. Uh, people began filling in among them with dirt and other debris. Uh, and uh, eventually, you had ships mingling with streets. Here's Niantic, uh, a whaler that was converted into a um, ship to bring passengers out. And here's Niantic on the right side, uh, surrounded by streets. Uh, and by the way, one building over is Apollo, another ship. Uh, Two-story hotel built on her deck, hull cut in her bow, and the hull turned into a store. Mm -hmm. uh, and in 1851, all of these buildings and ships burned. Uh, and more fill was brought in, and eventually they simply disappeared and were pr pretty much forgotten about. When the Transamerica Tower was built, uh, digging down to put the foundation in, they found Niantic. And this is the rudder uh, and stern of Niantic, which is in the uh, San Francisco Maritime Museum over there. Uh, there are other artifacts from it and from dozens of other ships that were buried under the street. One of those ships was the General Harrison. Uh, here's a diagram of the General Harrison as it might have looked like as a store ship. You can see they've cut holes, they've cut doors in the hull. Uh, they have, uh, you know, made it into a, a storage ship. Here's the General Harrison when it was dug up. The uh, Harrison uh, was uncovered. Uh, when uh, they were uh, building the, uh, it'll, it'll find it, it's a hotel. Uh, and uh, when they hosed off the dirt, the anaerobic mud, which had preserved everything, uh, the man down in the hall said it still smelled like burnt lumber and one. Because one of the major things that General Harrison had been laden with as a store ship 
apparently were cases and cases of wine, and spirits, and champagne. Uh, and some of the bottles were still intact with their uh, corks. Along with those things, there were barrels of uh, nails, there were bolts of cloth, there were bags that contained beans and rice and other goods that, that they recovered when they dug up the ship. There were something called water lots, and water lots were sold. And by the way, there are water lots just offshore here because if you look at an old map of Sausalito, the, the plan was to fill from here to Tiburon, and so there are streets that run out uh, under the bay here, on the, on, or platted on the, on the map. Eventually, San Francisco said it was illegal to fill a water lot. So what did you do? Well, you bought a ship, you had it towed in, and then conveniently had it burned or sink, because then it had to be dealt with, and the only way to really deal with it was to fill it in. Uh, Rome was an example. Now, Rome is one of those ships you can't ride on, but you can ride through. Because when they were digging the tunnel for Muni down by Justin Herman Plaza, they suddenly ran into wood. And it was determined that it was Rome, 30 feet under Market Street. So what to do? Well, the builders just bored right through it. <laughs> Uh, and built the uh, Muni Tunnel. So if you're right on the, the M car, the N car, the, this, all of the, those cars on the Muni, those trains, you'll go on the left tunnel going north, you'll ride right through the, uh, the bow of the road. Um, Candace is another example of a ship that was left, but this one is a Hare's breaking yard. Uh, and, uh, Many of the ships were broken up. Parts were reused, timbers were used to build buildings, sails were sold uh, to make tents, all of that sort of stuff. And a man named Hare had a breaking yard. Uh, and uh, when, again, when they were excavating for uh, a building, here's the, the bow of Candace. And one of the funny things about this uncovering thing was it didn't have any wine or things like that on it, but had the tools, uh, levering arms and sledgehammers and <coughs> other things left by the Chinese workers who air hire to break up the ships. Here's a map of uh, 40 of the ships that are under San Francisco. Uh, one of the things you'll notice that they're more or less aligned in the same configuration as the streets. Mm -hmm because even though uh, there was no land there, this, the streets had been plotted, and so when they brought a ship in, they lined it up with the, uh, with the street. And throughout San Francisco, you'll find, in the financial district, you'll find bronze plaques. And here's one that uh, shows where you are with the star in the middle. Shows the, and, and next to it is another plaque that has the names of the ships, and the dotted line is the waterfront in 1888 as it gradually oozed out towards what is now the Embarcadero. Okay, enough about the ghost ships and the gold rush, yes? What's the of the wine Well, uh, I think some of it, Doug can say, some of it's probably in the, uh, in the museum. I don't. I don't think it was probably palatable. But it, it probably wasn't all that great to begin with. But uh, it, it was interesting uh, that they that they found you know, intact bottles, cases of wine that had been preserved. In, in, and all of these ships, by the way, with except except for a few pieces of them, once they've been examined, uh, they're covered back up with uh, with the same mud that they had been buried in because. It was the, the anaerobic nature of the mud that kept the oxygen away from deteriorating them. So they'll be there forever. Uh, 
more or less. Did they, did they just uh, make holes in the clothes for them to sink? How what? did they sink them? Just drill holes? Um, well, they just they, they just put they brought them in a low to that high that low tide or high tide whichever it is and grounded them and then just started filling. And over the years, the level of downtown San Francisco has gone up, and most of them, they're all burned to the water line, so it's not really a, a full ship. And most of the hulls are 30, 40 feet under the current street level because of the fill that's been put in on top of them. Okay, let's move on to uh, uh, Navy ships. Uh, the Navy has had a presence on San Francisco Bay since before <clears throat> California was a state and before the gold rush, in the early 1840s, there were uh, Navy survey ships poking around. The, the Spanish or the Mexicans at that point didn't like it, but they didn't have much choice because the American ships had more guns than uh, the Mexicans had <laughs> over at Fort Point, so uh, they allowed them to come in poked around uh, to see what there was. Anybody know about the four corners of uh, Angel Island? Blunt, Knox, Campbell, Stewart. Stewart, named after, obviously not anyone with the Spanish name. <laughs> Those were officers on one of the ships that was in the bay in 1841 surveying what was here. So they wrote a, they built, they made a map of Angel Island and conveniently and conveniently named it after themselves. <laughs> and other places the same thing happened. In 1854, uh, Mare Island, after California became a state, in 1854 uh, the Mare, Mare Island Naval Shipyard was constructed or construction began. Uh, the, the West, the, the, at Venetia, the Army of the West was headquartered. Uh, so there was a big, heavy military presence from the very beginning of statehood, even before that, in California. And in that time, <clears throat> thousands of Navy ships have visited and left and visited and left. However, a few visited and didn't leave. So now it's a look at a few of the Navy ships that came but didn't leave. Uh, we're going to start with the oldest one that we're looking at tonight. This is USS Conestoga. Conestoga was a civilian tug built to haul coal barges back and forth on the East Coast. And in 1918, she was purchased by the U.S. Navy, converted to a Navy tugboat by putting a three-inch gun just there under the pilot house. And in 1920, she was dispatched through the Panama Canal to Mare Island. And in 1921, she was dispatched to Hawaii on the way to Samoa, where, where of course, American Samoa was a port in the, on the east and they needed a tugboat. So on, uh, in 1921, she left Mare Island towing a barge of coal destined for uh, Pearl Harbor uh, and disappeared. Mm -hmm. After a month, the Navy decided that they ought to go looking for her. Uh, and thinking that she had actually made it all the way, almost to Hawaii, uh, they started the search. Uh, and they searched, um, let me turn the page here. <coughs> They searched and sent out every ship and every airplane of the day they could, uh, and included, and, and they didn't find her. Uh, about a year later, a lifeboat with an R on 
of uh, you know, the sea on it, rather, a sea on it, all encrusted with barnacles, drifted up on the beach in Manzanillo. Um, but that was dismissed by the Navy as perhaps it just got swept off the boat in a storm. They still thought that, uh, that she was somewhere near the uh, Here's the, the crew that left that day. Up on the top deck are the two black sail seamen who were the pursers, or the, the, the mess men of the ship. Officers down in front. Uh, and here is the plan. The dotted line from Merrill Island to Pearl Harbor was the idea. You can see at the bottom how she got from the East Coast to the West Coast. And at the top, perhaps a little hard to see, is her actual voyage about three or four miles southeast of the east of the Farallon Island. During the search, one of the more bizarre episodes in American naval history occurred. R-14, the submarines of the day didn't have names, they just had numbers. R-14 was one of the boats searching for Conestoga off of the big island of Hawaii. Uh, when she lost all of her power, no electricity at all. She couldn't start the engine, she couldn't use the batteries. Uh, it, it just was a dead loss. Can you make out the sail? <laughs> the captain ordered the crew to take the battery canvas, battery covers, and sew them into a sail, and they hooked it onto the, they, they raised the forward <coughs> torpedo crane, the aft torpedo crane, and on the radio mast they, they rigged sails. And from 100 miles off of Hilo, they sailed for five days, wow. and finally got close enough to Hilo that someone saw them and sent a tug out to pull them in. So you're wow. looking at the only sailboat submarine. <laughs> wow. Probably in the history of the world. Uh, and you can see all the young sailors are really having a hard time uh, with it all. <laughs> well, in 2015, the Park Service did a survey of the Gulf of the Farallons to catalog the wrecks that were there. Many of them were known, but they came across a 52 meter wreck. They didn't know. What it was was uncertain. They suspected after a while that it could have been Conestoga because the measurements matched up. But looking at the scan, you can't really tell. So a year later, they sent down an ROV with a camera. And in the top photo, you have the three inch gun that was fitted to Conestoga on the, the, the deck below the deck house. And down at the bottom, if you look and squint a little bit, you see the same three-inch gun, uh, which confirmed that in fact it was uh, USS Conestoga. Still out there. The, the location is not is being kept secret as it could, can be, because it's a, it's a grave. Uh, the 52 men on the ship perished that day, probably only a few hours after they cleared the Golden Gate. Yeah. Uh, and some of them, likely when the boat was overcome by the, it was stormy that day, was overcome by the storm, were trapped below and probably still remain entombed in what's left of the boat. Now we go quickly to USS Thompson. DD-305 laid down and built at Union Iron Works in San Francisco. One of a number of Simpson-class destroyers built in San Francisco to get into the world, into the Great War to end all war effort. Uh, she made it there in 1920. It's a little bit late for getting into the war. So from 1920 till 1930, she served in the Pacific. Uh, here's. Uh, Thompson laying down a smoke screen because before radar, the way you obscured your fleet from the other fleet that was aiming at you was to put up 
big smoke screen so they couldn't see you. Um, they didn't have any radar to penetrate the smoke screen, so they, they gave you some protection from their fire. And uh, in 1923, she was part of a 14 destroyer flotilla that left San Francisco, headed for San Diego on a high speed maneuver, averaging about 20 knots to prove that they could get from one place to the other. When the commander decided it was time to turn into the Santa Barbara Channel, a little premature. Seven of the, of the destroyers wrecked on Honda Point, and the fact are still there. Uh, there were fatalities. But Thompson was lucky because she was not in the lead, she was in the back, and heard the sirens, uh, the emergency sirens coming from the ships that were stranded, alerting someone that I'm in, I need help, uh, and turned away and, and survived the day. But she couldn't survive the Treaty of 1930 that limited tonnage of warships. Uh, conveniently, the U.S. Navy found a whole bunch of obsolete World War I wannabe destroyers uh, that didn't have any particular use, and so they struck them from the, the list and scrapped them. This is Thompson at, uh, uh, at Mare Island. You can see that the, the fort and the gun has been removed. A, a lot of the superstructure has been removed, but she was saved again. An entrepreneur from Redwood City bought the Hulk, towed it to Redwood Creek, built a nightclub on it, oh, and from 1930 to early 1940s, uh, it was a bar, nightclub, dance hall in Redwood Creek. And then in 1944, the U.S. Navy needed a target ship, so they bought the Hulk back, towed it out about two miles or so off of Redwood, City onto the mudflat, uh, scuttled it, and for the next year it was bombed and strafed and uh, attacked by eager young naval aviators who were training to hit the enemy. They dropped bombs. Oh, this is a bomb, uh, by the way. Don't drop it. Uh, it's hollow. And a 10-gauge signal shell fits inside. Hmm. They put a wire apparatus on the nose with a, uh, a, 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 a thing. What is it? Detonator. Watch out. Uh, uh, you've got the, the, Primer. Yeah. And when it hit, out of the back came black powder smoke and a little tinge of red because they put some red phosphorus in the shell. Uh, and that way, the uh, observers who were a convenient distance away could, re could record whether you, in fact, had hit the ship or not. So I'm going to pause for a moment and pass this around. Don't drop it. <laughs> it won't explode, but I guarantee you at three pounds, it will break its toe. <laughs> And you'll see in the you'll see in the nose of it the little the little holes that the mechanism fit into. There are thousands of these projectiles scattered around the wreckage of USS Thompson. They were fitted eight to a, uh, in a tube under the airplane, eight of them, and there was a little gate at the end. And as the pilot their dive bombings. The pilot came down at the point where he wanted to release the bomb and he pushed the release and one bomb was released and it, it hit. It went around again, came back, the next one, around again, until and, and then behind him came the other 200 or so young ensigns who were learning how to dive bomb. Uh, it is uh, still there. So there's a landmark north of the Dumbarton Bridge for yeah. pilots that you're throwing in at Palo Alto. Yeah. They were called the sunken ship. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. That's that's the ship. 
Uh, and that's the bomb. It's an M23 practice bomb. This particular model came from a dump that was uncovered at the Santa Rosa Naval Air Station when they were uh, making how turning into houses. So the U.S. Navy had it happen that was burying things, and they buried uh, they buried a bunch of bombs. And this one was stuck up there. This is Thompson today. There's a there's a, a barge that sits next to it. It's also sunk, but that's the ship, and it's a favorite haunt. for kayakers to come out from uh, Red River City and, and sort of investigate things. And now, uh, we're going to talk to USS Benevolence. Uh, Benevolence, uh, AH-13, uh, was a U.S. Navy hospital ship. And I'm going to turn the mic over to my friend Garland who's going to tell you about what happened to her. <laughs> it's situated here without altering course. <laughs> I'm, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm Garland Sloan. And I want to talk to you this evening about the sinking of the Navy hospital ship USS Benevolence on August 25th, 1950. Uh, but before I get into the to that sinking, I would like to very briefly give you a little history of the ship, when and where it was built. It was not built as a hospital ship to begin with. 1944, at a shipyard in Pennsylvania, the merchant marine vessel, Marine Lion, was constructed. Less than a month after it was christened the Marine Lion, the ship was turned over to the Navy, who immediately began converting it to a hospital ship. They did that work at, at a shipyard in New York, and it took from from that July until early May 1945 to complete all the work that had to be done. At that point, a crew was brought aboard and she had orders to uh, proceed to Anawitok in the Marshall Islands out in the South Pacific, where she went and stayed servicing wounded ill, whatever people needed hospitalization, taking them aboard the hospital ship Benevolence and treating them from Manawitok and other islands in the Marshall Group. They, um, after doing that for quite, quite a long time, in August of 1945, she joined the Third Fleet, which was on its way to do its final battles against the Japanese. And after that was all done, the war was over shortly after that. Then uh, World War II being over, the benevolence anchored off Yokosuka, Japan, and took aboard newly released prisoners of war and other wounded and, and sick personnel. They did that for a few months, and then they, they went uh, with a load of patients there, were, there was a room on that ship for 800 patients. So they transport, transported a load of patients to San Francisco from Yakuska. And during the time from, from uh, December 45 until February 46, she made three round trips from San Francisco to uh, Asia and back. And then in, in the late, in the, well, in September 1946, she made her final sail up to Mare Island where she was decommissioned and put in mothballs. Mm -hmm. That was September 1940, that was September 1947, excuse me. 
Then, in, in 1950, the Korean War started in June of 1950, and we who came aboard the ship at that time came aboard for several weeks before uh, the 25th of August, that fateful day of 25 August uh, 1950. It was a sad day for us. We had been working on the ship, getting everything in shape for doing sea duty and, and, and going to Korea for duty there. And on our way in, on our way back into San Francisco from our uh, final shakedown cruise, just a few miles off California, in the main, in the main shipping channel, uh, heading into the Golden Gate, we collided with the SS Mary Lockenbach, a merchant cargo ship, having just left San Francisco on its way to Pennsylvania. But it never made that trip to Pennsylvania. We, we collided. It tore a five by 50 foot strip out of the port bow of, of the benevolence. And quite a large amount of damage was done to the bow of the Lockenbach. But she did stay afloat, and I don't know, any, all of us aboard the benevolence had no idea what had happened. Many of us were in the mess hall at evening, evening chow, and uh, when the collision happened, there was, a, of course, a terrible noise, scraping, and, and just noise. Still, un, uh, still did, we still didn't know what it was. Then the order came over the loudspeaker. All hands prepared to abandon the ship. She was already beginning to list a little to the port. My buddy Horton and I left out of the mess hall together as everybody was getting out of there as fast as we could, using the narrow ladder that led up to the next deck out of the mess hall. And as we went up that ladder, we discussed life jackets, which we had never, none of us had ever been issued life jackets in the workshop. <laughs> so Horton and I found, the, found a life jacket locker. It was a very large room with one door going in. And we stood in that door and handed out life jackets. They are the old World War II K-Pak life jackets. I don't know if any of you here are familiar with those. We all swore that if you through water in the water by itself, it would sink. <laughs> we, we handed those out to people as they came by until it looked like there was no more, there were no more people to come by. Then Horton and I both grabbed a life jacket and went out on the weather deck. And by that time, the ship had listed far enough we could actually walk on the starboard side, stand up and walk on the side of the ship. We did that sat down out there talking about where we might be going. We couldn't see anywhere. It was a very dense fog. And uh, the ship had not sunk yet, so we were still waiting for the order to abandon the ship. It's a, it's a law in the Navy. If you leave a ship without an order to abandon ship, and if, if in any case that ship does not sink, you can be charged with desertion. So we didn't want anything, we didn't want anything like that to happen. So we sat there discussing the situation. <laughs> Before too much longer, though, we, time was kind of stood still at that time. We, we didn't know. We had no idea where we were. We still had no idea what had happened to our ship, and we didn't know where we wanted to go. We couldn't see any land. Couldn't see any, we couldn't see anywhere. We saw no lights of anything to indicate that there might be land somewhere out there. But being ignorant of the design of the hull of the ship, what I later learned was the starboard stabilizer came up out of the water just a few feet from where Horton and I were sitting. And I thought that was the keel. And I, 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 we're in bad trouble with it. If that's the deal, she's about to, she's about to go. 
So I said, Horton, we better get the hell out of here. So we stood up and secured our life jackets. I took my white hat and pulled it and put it in my jumper. I took off my shoes, tied them together, and hung them around my neck. Now, I, to this day, I cannot tell you what I might have thought I was going to do with that pair of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I did it, and I did, they didn't stick with me very long. No, I lost, lost my shoes. <laughs> and uh, we went and swam as fast as we could to get away from the ship, because one of the things you're taught as early as boot camp, if you're in a sinking situation, you get away from that ship as fast as possible, as fast and as far so you won't get caught into suction when she goes down. Now actually, the benevolence had a 75 and a half foot beam, and that water couldn't have been over 80 feet deep. At that, we were in the main shipping channel coming in towards the Golden Gate, about three or four miles out. And, but at any rate, we swam out quite a ways, and we heard somebody yelling behind us. We turned and looked around, and there was a guy Back there, he looked like he was falling out of his life jacket. And he was back quite a ways, but not but closer to us than the ship. So we turned and went back. And when we got to him, we saw that indeed he was falling out of his life jacket because those old K-Pak life jackets had a strap that went under your crotch and fastened to a buckle in the front. He had neglected to get that fastened properly. And he was going down underwater, still holding on to the life jacket, came up and we yell again and we got there and one of us held him while the other one fixed his strap to the to the uh, to him and the life jacket. Then we all swam away together. And it, it began to get dark fairly what seemed like fairly soon. And uh, of course the fog was so thick it didn't didn't take much to become darkness. But well, as, as the night wore on, we kept coming across other people. And when we did, we would latch on to them. One or the other of us would like grab them with our left hand and continue swimming with our right hand. And we wound up with a, with a little, uh, we had 14 in our little circle. And um, we had, had, we had uh, aboard the benevolence, we had 15 nurses. 19 doctors and 159 corpsmen, plus the other seamen that were on board to run the ship. And uh, a few uh, civilian engineers were on board for that final shakedown. They, they had been at Mare Island working on the ship to put it back into commission all this time. So anyway, we, are, we were all in the water at that time, and, and uh, we had we, we had seemed like, again, time had no meaning. It seemed like we'd been in the water all night. And eventually our boat pulled up alongside our, our little group. He cut his engines, lowered ladders over the side so we could climb on board. The boat was the fishing boat Flora out of San Francisco. John Angelo Napoli was the skipper and owner of that boat. He picked up 70 people that night, oh and, and he took us all to where he, he had seen where the looking back was anchoring. And that was the first contact that we knew about that we had with the, with the Mary looking back. He put us aboard the looking back, but his, in helping us come up the ladders onto his boat, in the process of getting us on stretchers and getting us moved to up to the deck of the looking back from his boat. Um, John had injured his back in such a way that he was never able to follow his fishing profession again for the rest of his life. And the bow of his boat had suffered, suffered extensive damage. He, he didn't complain but he did leave with his boat and did make it back to San Francisco all alone. And uh, 
and uh, John, John Napoleon died in 19, July 1975 and was buried at his home in Terralinda, just north of here, always. And uh, so that, uh, those of us who had left were on the, on the uh, look back. Those, we found that those merchant seamen have staterooms with two people to each stateroom. We thought, boy, oh boy, no wonder they're in the merchant marine instead of the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> our Navy, our bunks on a Navy ship were so close together. If you wanted to turn over, you slipped yourself out of the boat, turned over and slipped back in. <laughs> there was no room, no room to turn over underneath the guy yeah, above you. But anyway, two of us were at one of the staterooms, Father Reardon, a Catholic priest who had been the chaplain on our ship. He and I were in the room and one of the seamen, well, they brought us warm clothes first. They, they turned to it with all kinds of clothes that they donated to us and we got out of those wet things and got into the warm clothes. And one of the, one of the seamen from the local back brought a bottle of whiskey into that room <laughs> and gave it to Father Reardon and I and me. We finished that quart of whiskey before we left that ship. <laughs> and I don't think we even felt it, really. Yeah. It was so cold. That, that water was unbelievable. But at some time later, that was around midnight, John Napoleon picked us up. Later in that, still dark, an army tug came and picked up several of us from the looking back and took us into, brought us into uh, and passed the Golden Gate, uh, left us off at a pier, but I, I couldn't swear to it, but I believe it was Pier 32. And when we got there, and got off the boat onto the pier. Uh, yes? There were no lifeboats on that ship? There were many lifeboats. What happened? They were not able to launch them because she missed it so fast that the boats got hung up in gear. Not one single lifeboat got, left, got launched because of that. And there are pictures of, of the ship later because, as I say, it was a very few feet of water over the <laughs> side and the big red cross was so such that you could still see it after it was sunk and lying there. You still see the red crosses. And uh, we're, so the red cross was there at, at the pier. They gave us coffee and cigarettes. <laughs> and uh, believe me, that I stopped smoking many years later. But that cigarette tasted pretty good. In the first night. <laughs> I hadn't had a cigarette since the night, the, the evening before. And I was I was feeling pretty good with that first smoke. Then ambulances came, and with a motorcycle police escort, took us over to across the bay to Oak Knoll. Navy Hospital out in East Oakland, mm -hmm. uh, right out in the neighborhood of Oakland, I'm sure you are, uh, out MacArthur Boulevard, which at that time was Highway 50. And we were there at Oak Knoll Hospital for about a week and then transferred back to uh, Treasure Island. And we're there awaiting reassignment. Uh, I, I was there and Horton also was there approximately two weeks. And I, I was reassigned to a ship in San Diego, the uh, LSD-16 USS Cabildo, LSD-16. People nowadays, I tell them about this, my ship was an LSD. They tell me, they tell me, man, that's not a ship, it's a trip. <laughs> <laughs> it was a landing ship dock. We, could, we, could, we had a well deck we could actually take LSTs on board and, and service them, do repairs and such. But it was, uh, we lost one nurse in the, in the sinking of the benevolence. But she didn't die in the water. She had been pulled up onto a rescue boat and had a heart attack and died. And the following week at Oak Knoll Chapel, there was a memorial service for her and then another one of the Navy nurses um, accompanied her body back to Chillicothe, Texas, 
where she was buried next to her parents, right there. And there were other people, they were, we lost 23 altogether, including that one nurse. Um, it, it was too bad. They found most of the bodies, but they didn't find them all. There were four of that 23 who remained, they, they were never found. They just never showed up for Mr. after. So I served on the uh, Cabildo for the rest of my uh, enlistment, and then I got out of the Navy. Now, the rest of the story, 55 years later, 2005, my wife Caroline and I were at a, we were guests at a wedding in Bodega Bay. We noticed looking at the program that one of the bridesmaids, the last name was, was Napoli. After, uh, <clears throat> after, after the ceremony, marriage ceremony, my wife looked her and brought her and introduced her to me. And uh, we danced during the, the, rest, the whole rest of the evening. We danced, we talked about her, what she could remember of her ancestry. And she knew that her father's name was John Napoleon. Her grandfather's name was John Napoleon. Her great-grandfather's name, who was also a fisherman, was named John Angelo Napoleon. Mm -hmm. And his wife was named Flora. This girl's great-grandmother was Flora. That was the name, you remember, of the boat that picked us up. So for the rest of my life, I believe, <laughs> I will always believe that I danced with John Napoli's great granddaughter. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Bob. I'm not sure why I'm getting feedback suddenly, but I am. Uh, there is the location of Benevolence, just right near the end of the shipping channel, a little bit south of the shipping channel. Uh, Benevolence was about 72 feet wide, and it sank in about 75 feet of water. So the pictures I, I showed you back, uh, the ship was a wash. And in that picture, if you look, you can see lifeboats floating next to it, hooked on to the ship. Because those were the, the lifeboats that they were unable to launch because half of them were underwater and the other half were just sitting on top of the hull. Um, in 1950, uh, uh, <clears throat> several, several tugboats, fishing boats hit. They, they put buoys on the wreckage but it was struck several times. And so in 1952, the Army Corps of Engineers uh, put 150,000, that's the number, but it seems large to me, the pounds of explosives inside the hull and blew it up. So as you come out and take that left turn headed for Half Moon Bay, uh, just a little bit south of the last buoy, on the shipping channel, uh, you're sailing over the, the wreckage of <laughs> benevolence, which, by the way, is also a grave. Because those four missing men, it's assumed, were trapped inside the hull when the, when the ship sank. Uh, the real miracle, I think, was that only 23 perished. And think about it. Garland wearing dungarees with his shoes around his neck in a K-Pak life jacket that only kept him half out of the water, floated around between 5 p.m. and sometime after midnight in the Gulf of the Carolines. Uh, Do you know what the temperature of the water was? 
Do you, do, do you know what the temperature of the water? Well, the temperature of the water out there, as I understand, is around 58 degrees, typically, I think. Yeah. On a good day. Yeah. 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 What's what, what uh, this, the this was a uh, This was a very <clears throat> foggy day, uh, and, it, and, and it went into the night, you know, because it got dark, and it wasn't until after midnight that this group was picked up. Uh, the miracle is that uh, of all the uh, of all the people who made it into the water, on, only a uh, few perished because of hypothermia or some something like that. They all were picked up by fishing boats and small uh, army, navy, coast guard boats that were sent out and in the fog, wandered around looking for people in the, in the water. It was a, it was an amazing sort of thing, I think. What was the date again that it sunk? 25th of August. August 25th, 1950. The water's probably as warm as it'll be. <laughs> I, I can tell you, I don't know the temperature, but I can tell you that I'm 91 years old now. I'm never before or since been that cold. <laughs> 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 I've been in <laughs> So. That brings us to the end of the, the talk. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so the next time, the next time you uh, sail to uh, Vallejo or the Delta, go by San Pablo Bay. Take a look over there and think about it. Next time you walk over to Bob Murata's, uh Yacht Brokerage or wander out to the Spinnaker for a tourist lunch, uh, think think about it. Next time you ride a pony, uh, subway train. Next time you uh, walk around uh, or drive around the financial district. Uh, next time you go to Half Moon Bay and take that left turn out near the uh, shipping channel. Think about uh, all of those ships that came and stayed. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.